Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new series, Life Goes On. What do you do when terrible troubles steal your song? Today you'll learn how to find hope and healing and learn to sing again in an encouraging message called How to Sing in the Rain. Psalm 137 is an interesting psalm. It's written by those who were taken captive to Babylon. If you remember your Bible history, you know that Israel started out in the Promised Land, uh, led out of Egypt by Moses, led into the Promised Land by Joshua. They conquered the territories in the book of Joshua, and they were one nation, the nation of Israel. And their first king was Saul, and then came David, and then came Solomon. And then after Solomon, there was a king, his son Rehoboam. And under the kingdom of Rehoboam, uh, Israel split. Ten tribes said, we're not going to follow Rehoboam, and they became the northern kingdom. Two tribes stayed with Rehoboam as king, Judah and Benjamin, and they became known as the southern kingdom or the kingdom of Judah. Their capital city was Jerusalem. The ten tribes didn't do well they immediately uh, started to follow false gods, and it wasn't uh, too terribly long before they had totally apostatized, and uh, the Lord allowed Assyria to take them over in 722 B.C. Judah lasted longer. They were a little more faithful to the Lord, but in 605 B.C., God allowed Babylon to come and to put Judah down, so to speak. They were under Babylon's thumb for years, and Nebuchadnezzar took, he defeated Jerusalem in 605 B.C. He took captives back in 605 B.C., the ones that we know of, namely Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They came from, had to go from Jerusalem all the way 900 miles to Babylon to be exiles in Babylon in 605 B.C., 597 B.C., uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in, slapped uh, Judah around some more, took more captives, and then in 586 B.C., he came in, besieged the city for a long time, and then came in and broke down the walls and destroyed the city and burned Solomon's temple and, and wrecked and ruined it beyond recognition. It was a terrible time, so terrible that Jeremiah writes about it. There's a whole book in the Bible about it. It's called Lamentations. It was awful. Well, these thousands and thousands of people who were taken from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon, 900-mile trip, they didn't want to be there. They share their experience in Psalm 137 says this, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs and our tormentors mirth or joy, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing? the Lord's song, in a foreign land. Hey, how can we sing in the rain? How can we sing when the bottom drops out of life? God wants to teach us how to do that. Hey, what do you do when terrible troubles steal your song, your passion, your zest for living, where you just feel like saying, I'm done, I quit? God says, no, you can't Here's how to get your song back. Three steps from Psalm 137 to regain your song. Step number one, get totally honest with God. Totally honest with God. Now, that's something that many of us don't really like to do. 
We don't like to get honest about how we're hurting. We don't like to get honest about our feelings. We, we throw sheets over things and thinking, well, that'll just go away. If I, if I cover it up, then it's just going to go away. Doesn't, life doesn't work that way. And so if we want to get better and we want to regain our song, if we've lost our song because of divorce or betrayal or some terrible rejection, how do we do that? We have to get honest with God. Psalm 62, verse 8 says this, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Whatever's in your heart today, God says, I want you to share that with me. All your hurts, all your uh, heartaches, all your disappointments, all your frustrations, share it with me. Let me know what's going on. I mean, God knows it already, but there's something about you telling him that is very healing for you. You know, Hannah had a big problem in 1 Samuel chapter 1. She was barren, and uh, her rival, her husband's other wife, he had two wives, Elkanah had two wives, and Peninnah was the other wife. She had lots of kids, and Hannah couldn't have any kids, and, and Peninnah would make fun of Hannah because she was barren, and that was such a stigma to the women in Israel if you couldn't have a child, and, and she just came to the altar, and she poured out her heart to the Lord, and the Scripture says after she poured out her heart and her hurt to the Lord, she felt much better. Her face was no longer sad. There's something cathartic about tears and about crying and about sharing those things with the Lord. Get totally honest with him. Pour out your heart to him. Now, here's some questions to ask yourself, because for some of us in this room, we've stuffed a lot of feelings, and uh, we've acted like it's no big deal, and it's a big deal, and it will come back to haunt you. My friend John Finch, who produced that movie, The Father Effect, he said he didn't know how much his father killing himself when he was 12 really affected his life and continued to affect his life. Why? Because he had stuffed all those feelings down. And uh, to do that is like burying toxic waste. You're never going to be able to bury it. Those, those containers are going to leak, and that stuff is going to come out, and it's going to poison your life. So ask yourself some questions. Question number one. Have you experienced a great trauma in life? A great trauma. These people had experienced a great trauma, tremendous trauma. The things that the Babylonians did to them when they came in and destroyed their, their sacred city. I mean, Jerusalem is not like somebody coming into Washington, D.C. and tearing down the White House, as, as bad as that would be uh, for us to, to witness that. You're talking about the city of God. This is the place where God's presence in the temple, God's presence was there. And all of a sudden, it's destroyed. The enemy had come in. The pagans had come in. It was awful. They had experienced a great trauma. So many people were getting killed. So many uh, pregnant women were being killed in this disaster as the Babylonians came in and destroyed the city. And they were by the rivers of Babylon. Now, Babylon has two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. These are the rivers of Babylon, probably the canals of Babylon. These people might have been canal diggers. And it says that they sat down and wept. They put their elbows on their knees. They squatted down, which is a, uh, kind of the posture of mourning in the ancient Near East at this time and they wept. And they didn't just cry a, a tear or two. That word wept means to wail. It means to sob. And they were just sobbing because of their plight in life. Hey, have you experienced a great trauma? There's probably not a person in this room who hasn't experienced some kind of trauma. But if you've been throwing a sheet over your hurt and your pain, you need to pull the sheet off. You need to deal with that. You need to get that out. Second question, do you feel as if God has forgotten you? They felt like that. God has forgotten me. Now, why would they feel like that? Because if you're a Jew living in Jerusalem, you feel like we're God's chosen people, and that's right, you are, 
And uh, this is God's city, and you're right, it is. Uh, this is the city, it's called in the book of Psalms, the city of the great king. And the great king is God. And so this is God's city. God chose that place. God loves the, the, the place known as Zion. God loves Jerusalem. He chose it from all the other places on the earth. He chose that place to put his glory. So we're in Jerusalem. This is God's city. This is God's temple. This is God's presence. God is greater than any other God. There is no other God like God. And yet the Babylonians, who are pagans, they worship Marduk. They worship a false god. They come in, and they whip us. And the Jews are saying, God, what's the deal? How does this happen? How do, how do these pagans defeat us and defeat you, God? How does Marduk beat Yahweh? Because that's the mindset back then. Our God beat your God. And so you see in this psalm, the captors were laughing. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Sing us about the joy of your God. You know, one of the things I love about psalms, psalms is true to life. Psalms lets you know, hey, this is what's going on. It doesn't sugarcoat stuff. David a man after God's own heart, he would share from his heart in the book of Psalms. I think every Christian ought to read Psalms every single day. Read uh, a psalm or two or five. If you read five psalms a day, every month you read through the book of Psalms. Jesus quoted from the book of Psalms quite often. David, in the book of Psalms, he'll tell you how he feels. And he said in Psalm chapter 13, verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Now, did David really think that God had forgotten him? No, but he felt like that. And Psalms tells you, hey, feelings are what they are. Feelings are not necessarily right or wrong. They're just feelings. Now, you can't let feelings lead your life. You can't let them drive the train, but feelings are what feelings are. And so David would share his feelings, and if you read Psalm 13, you'll find out at the end of Psalm 13, he says, but I'm going to trust in you. As Job said, though he slay me, speaking of the Lord, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But hey, if you're feeling like God has forgotten you, share that with him. Let him know that. Lord, I don't understand. Don't you care that I'm hurting here? Don't you care that I can't see what to do? Lord, I need you. Don't hide your face from me. Psalm 42 Verse 3 talks about the plight of the captives in Babylon. And it says this, My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Because our God, Marduk, the Babylonian God, beat Jehovah, Yahweh, and they made fun of them. Hey, sing us one of the songs of Babel, uh, one of the songs of Zion. So do you feel as if God has forgotten you? And question number three, have you given up? What does it say in verse 2? As they're mourning, as they're weeping, when we remembered Zion, upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. We're done. We're not singing anymore. We're not playing anymore. We brought our harps, but we're not going to play our harps because we've lost our song. Have you given up? It's a sad picture, this willow tree. It's called a Babylonian willow tree. I have a picture of it that we can show. It's just a droopy, sad tree. And that's a good picture of what those people were like on the inside, just so sad, so forlorn. They just felt like they had lost everything. They were strangers in a strange land. They didn't want to be there. They gave up. They hung up their harps, never to sing again, never to play again. I like what Jerry Falwell was famous for saying. It's always too early to quit. It's always too early to quit. Don't hang up your harp. It's always too early, early to quit, but it's never too early to get honest with God about how you feel. So that's the first step. If you want to learn how to sing in the rain, how to have joy even in the midst of sadness, get totally honest with God. Step number two, turn your attention 
to the kingdom of God. So the psalmist, he's unnamed. It's just an experience of one of the captives. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And then he shifts gears. He says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Turn your attention to the kingdom of God. Now, when the Bible uses Zion and Jerusalem, those are interchangeable. Those are, those are, you can't really separate those two. Zion is really, if you get really, really technical, that's what they called the city of David. And the city of David is right there in Jerusalem, and right above the city of David is the Temple Mount where Solomon built his temple. It's, it's separated a little bit, but not, not by very much, and all that is in is encased in Jerusalem. And so those are, they're one in the same as they talk about Zion, as they talk about Jerusalem. It's the dwelling place of the Most High God. And when the rains come and the storms of sorrows come, we need to remember the kingdom of God. Remember the kingdom of God because it's easy to forget about the kingdom. We get so tied into this world that we forget about the next world. And that word when he says, uh, if I forget you, that means to be oblivious of, to lose attention of, or, or your focus on. And many of us are guilty of that, especially in the hard times, because we get so, all we see is here, we see horizontally, we don't see Above, we don't see what God is doing. Turn your attention to the kingdom of God. Remember this a Christian is not of this world. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3. Peter says that we are aliens and strangers on this land, in, in this land. We really belong to God, we're citizens of heaven. And, and this is how it works. When a person comes to know Christ in a saving way, they repent of sin, they put their faith and trust in Jesus. The Lord saves them out of this world, so to speak, and sends them back to this world just like that. You, you die to your old way of life, you receive a brand new life in Jesus Christ. We pictured that today in baptism. Baptism is always done in a pool of water. Why? Because it's a visible representation of an invisible reality, buried with Christ through baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. You die to your old way of life, but you don't stay dead. You get a brand new life in Jesus Christ, and you go down and you come back up. So the Lord saves us out of this world and sends us back to this world, and our job is to be a witness in this world, but we're citizens of heaven, and we have to constantly remind ourselves, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Lord, don't, don't let me forget about the kingdom. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill. You know, if your right hand forgets her skill, it's going to be hard to make a living. If you don't know how to use the, your hands because they were a very hands-oriented society and farmers and, and things like that. And so it's very important to have skill in your hands. So if I, if I can't do anything, then I, how am I going to live? It, it, he says, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. Lord, if I don't praise you, then I don't want to have a voice at all. If I don't exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So a Christian is not of this world. A Christian is called to shine and share and sing in this world. Sing, metaphorically speaking. Shine, share, and sing. Those are all kind of the same thing. We're called to be his witnesses in this world. How do we witness in this world? By living a life that shines for Christ. Jesus said, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We shine, we share, we tell people about Jesus, and listen, we sing even in the hard times. We have joy even in the hard times. That is your greatest opportunity to witness for the Lord is in the hard times. 
anybody can praise God when everything's going great. It's when things are hard, when things are tough, when you're by the waters of Babylon and life has just uh, knocked everything out from underneath you. Then what do you do? Do you do what Job's wife said do, curse God and die? Or do you still praise him? Do you do what Job did and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him? I don't understand this. I don't like this, but I'm still going to trust in him. I'm still going to praise him. I'm still going to seek him. I've told you before that one of my heroes in the faith is Johnny Erickson. Johnny Erickson Tata. She, uh, our dear ladies made a quilt for her as she was battling cancer, and she sent us a picture uh, of her and her husband, Ken, and she's there in the, in the quilt, and she was so uh, thankful and appreciative. I, I saw Johnny when I was in uh, Nashville a few years ago for the National Religious Broadcasters Convention, and we took a picture together, and she's been in a wheelchair for 51 years. When she was 17, she was in a very athletic girl. She was in a diving accident. She went to the beach with her sister, and she jumped off this little pier thing that she thought was in deep water. It wasn't. It shallow water. She broke her neck. She almost drowned because she, she was totally uh, paraplegic as soon as she hit the ground. Her sister just happened to see her uh, floating, saw her hair floating there in the water. She went back and picked her up. Johnny... When they took her to the doctor, to the hospital, she thought, well, they can fix this. They couldn't fix it. And she was marginal as a believer at best. I think she probably was just a, a Christian in name only. I don't think it was real in her heart. But man, when she found out, you're never going to be able to walk again. You're going to be a quadriplegic in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. She just wanted to die. She said, I can't live like this. There's no way I can live like this. And she would be in her bed at night, and she would be moving her head from side to side, and she said, maybe I can break more of my neck, and then I could stop breathing, and I could just die. She would ask her friends that would come to see her, slash my wrist, please slash my wrist. I won't feel anything. I can't feel my, my arms. Just let me die. She would take her wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair, and she would try and run it into the wall to hopefully uh, cause her to fall and and kill herself. And she said it was one night. She was so alone spiritually, mentally, emotionally. She cried out to God and she said, God, if I can't die, then show me how to live. And God said, I'll answer that prayer. I'll show you how to live like this. And I think Johnny Erickson Tata is one of the greatest examples of Christianity that we have in our world today. She shines. She shares. She sings for the Lord in Babylon, in a dark place. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? That's what we're called to do. We live in a foreign land because our citizenship is in heaven. And when bad things happen on this earth, it's like, hey, he never said it was going to be easy here. He said it was going to be difficult. As he told the apostle Paul, hey, you're going to have to suffer for my name's sake. But we need to keep remembering the kingdom. We're here for a purpose. This is not our home. That's our home. We're getting ready one day. We don't know when, but the Lord is coming back to take us home to heaven. And until then, he's called us to be faithful. So a Christian's called to shine, share, and sing in this world. You know, Paul and Silas, when they went to Philippi, they ran into all kinds of problems because they were doing the Lord's will, and the devil and the world came against them. They were beaten with rods. They were put into prison for preaching the gospel, and they were put in the inner stocks. And it says this in Acts 16, 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Why? Because they didn't ever hear people sing praises to God when their backs were bleeding and they were in the stocks 
and they were in the inner prison. Oh, many people cried out for deliverance, but no one ever sang. They hadn't lost their song. The world listens when you are able to sing in the hard times, maybe even sing through the tears. They say there's something about your Christianity that makes a difference in your life. I want what you have. A Christian is called, thirdly, to seek first the kingdom of God. He says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her skill, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not exalt, cause to ascend Jerusalem above my chief joy. Let me ask you a, a very sobering question. Is the kingdom of God really the most important thing in your life? The Lord Jesus and his kingdom, is that really what governs your life? Is that govern, does that govern how you spend your time, how you spend your talent, how you spend your treasure? Is everything that you do, you're thinking about the kingdom. This is for the kingdom. This is to serve my Lord. Lord, how can I serve you today? Because it's all about you. It's not about me. It's not about me. And this is, I'm not going to spend my time uh, focused in on this world as far as building my life here because my citizenship is in heaven. I'm going to remember all the time my only job on this earth, my only reason for being on this earth is to be your witness. Now, when God sent those people to Babylon, he told them, listen, you, plant, you build houses there. You plant vineyards. You, build, you, you plant crops. You settle down there even though Jerusalem is where you want to be, even though, and they did go back, 70 years in captivity, then Zerubbabel led them back, and they came back, thousands, 50,000 came back to Jerusalem. But until that time, you live here in Babylon. Citizenship somewhere else, but you live here. That's the way we are. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're here on earth, but we need to make sure that we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and the things that we, as Jesus said, be, don't be anxious for what, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we clothe ourselves? God knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I will take care of you if you put me first. So we get honest with God. We turn our attention to the kingdom of God. And step number three, we trust God to make things right in the end. Hey, bad things happen to you. Bad things happen to me. Bad things happen to all of us. Things happen that we don't understand, that we can't make heads or tails of. Acts chapter 12, interesting little story. Acts chapter 12, Herod arrests James. James, the brother of John. James, the son of Zebedee. James was one of the big three, Peter, James, John. Those three guys got to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Jesus peel back the veil of his humanity, show them his deity. I mean, he, James is a big dog. And it says in Acts 12, he gets arrested and he gets executed. And then in the very next verse, it says that Herod arrests Peter and Peter gets delivered from prison. The angel comes and delivers Peter from prison. He was going to be executed the next day. Uh, the angel came and let him out. Now, if you're one of John's loved ones, if you're uh, uh, James's loved one, you're John. He's, he's, that's James's brother. You're thinking, hey, Lord, it would have been really nice if you had let James out of prison. I mean, you let Peter out of prison. Well, you, you let James get delivered over to the sword. How about, how about your Mrs. James saying, what gives God? Why, why didn't you deliver my husband? Why did you deliver Peter, but you don't deliver James? Who knows the answer to that question? Strange are the ways of God. We don't know. We just say, Lord, you're in charge. Lord, I trust you. I don't know why you do what you do. And you don't give me the answer most of the time when I ask the question, why? So I just say, all right, Lord, I choose to trust you. So we trust God to make things right in the end. And remember this, in your trauma, in your difficulty, in your heartache, 
God knows what has happened to you. He knows. They say in verse 7, Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one, you devastating or one, or you devastator. How blessed will be the one who repays you with the re recompense which you have repaid us. How blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. That's what they did to the Jews. When they came into the city, they would take their babies and they would dash them on the rocks. You can understand why Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. It was awful what happened when the Babylonians came in to Jerusalem. But God knows. They're saying, hey, Lord, you remember? You remember our neighbors to the uh, south, the Edomites? The Edomites were descendants of Esau, Jacob and Esau. You know, the, the sons of Israel, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. We talk about the tw 12 tribes of Israel. That's just the 12 tribes of this guy named Jacob. He had a twin brother named Esau. The Lord chose Jacob. He did not choose Esau. And Esau became the father of the Edomites. And the Edomites, they lived to the southeast of Judah. It's the modern-day Jordan. That's where the Edomites were. Well, when the Babylonians came in to destroy Jerusalem, the Edomites came out, and they had their pom-poms, and they had their uh, big placards, says, go Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, they were, they were cheering for the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem. He says, you remember, Lord, what the Edomites did? The day of Jerusalem, they said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. They wanted us wiped off the map. And God says, yeah, I know. I was there. I saw that. I know exactly what they did, and it was terrible. God knew what the Babylonians had done. God saw it all. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. Hey, rem remember, God knows everything. He sees everything. If you got lied about and that caused you to lose your job or something terrible to happen to you, someone stole from you, someone lied about you, someone did this to you, that to you, the other to you, and uh, everybody believes the lie, God knows the truth. We're getting a lot of stuff in social media today. He said, she said, this person accuses that person. Oh, I didn't do that. God knows the truth. And what you've whispered in your bedroom, Jesus said, is going to be broadcast from the housetops. The Lord knows. And the Lord will repay. God will avenge his adversaries. See, we read verses like verses 8 and 9. O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one. How blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us. How blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. We read stuff like that and we say, I don't think that should be in the Bible. How blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. I mean, that's, that's awful. Why would, why would anyone say that? They're saying, Lord, you saw what happened. And Lord, you repay them the way they repaid us. And here's the thing. We may not be able to understand everything about, there's a word in seminary. We call these imprecatory psalms. There are certain psalms that you read, all of a sudden it's like, uh, man, it's, it's really getting strong. God, we want you to destroy this place. That's called an imprecatory psalm where you're, you're kind of, uh, you know, denouncing curses on a place. We say, what, what about imprecatory psalms? Are we supposed to pray those things, imprecatory psalms? Because there would be a lot of people sign up for prayer time if we could pray imprecatory psalms. I mean, if you do greeting cards, imprecatory greeting cards, I'd like to send this to you. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of like that. But, but here's the, the sentiment behind it. It's like, God, you saw what they did to us. Lord, we're giving that to you. You repay them. It, it's not me as a Jew, speaking for the writer of Psalm 137, it's not me to seek their vengeance. Lord, you, you have vengeance on them. 
And that's what the Lord says in, Psalm, in Romans 12, 18. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So, Lord, I just deliver them over to you. God, you, God, you saw what they did to us, and Lord, you're a righteous judge, and Lord, we thank you that you're merciful. Boy, we want God to be merciful to us when we mess up. Somebody else messes up. We're like, go get them, God. But we just say, Lord, we deliver them over to you. You know, one of the things we talked about bitterness last week, one of the things that will help you and help me when it comes to someone who wrongs us, especially if they do it on purpose, is you pray for them. Not the imprecatory psalm. Pray that God would bless them. Pray that God would minister to them. Hurting people hurt people. And anybody that you see that's a mean, miserable, vindictive type of person, you just know that person is hurting. They've had a trauma in their life, and that's causing them to be the way they are. Pray for God to minister to them, for God to turn their hearts to him, for God to bless them. You say, why should I do that? Because it helps you. It keeps you from getting bitter. And so you turn all that over to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with this. I know that I can trust you. You give it to God. What do you do when the terrible storms come in, when the rain washes away your song? You get honest with God. You remember the kingdom. You trust God to make it all work out in the end. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Hey, listen, I don't know what's happened to you, but maybe you've hung up your harp on a willow tree. And the Lord says, I'm not done with you. I still have a plan for you. I want to take your hurt, and I want to turn it into a message so that you can shine, so that you can share, so that you can sing of my faithfulness, of my power, of my glory, that I'm a God who works all things together for good to those who love me. As we close out today, I'd like to ask you the most important question, and that's this. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about knowing about him in your head. I'm talking about really knowing him in your heart. If that's not true for you, today is the day to receive Christ. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. I ask you to come in, forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer. Write me, email me, call that toll-free number. Let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart the viewer-supported broadcast outreach of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real